Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel, The Francophile Reader. So today I want to talk about Ambroise Paré, who was a barber surgeon in the 16th century. He is considered the father of modern surgery. Now, when I am posting this video, I noticed that a video was posted on another channel about dog-headed people in the travels of Marco Polo and in the voyages of Sir John Mandeville. And having made a video already about Marco Polo, I know the kinds of comments I'm going to receive. So instead of me sort of suggesting that maybe certain creatures didn't exist, I'll let you decide. That's fine. This video isn't about that. This video is about the science that um, was accepted at this time and the explanations that are given for a variety of different creatures as well as deformities and disabilities. I do not want any of my videos to be freak shows, so I will not be sharing pictures of humans, at least not humans with conditions that we know of. For example, conjoined twins, uh, intersex individuals. These are mentioned by Ambroise Paré. I will talk a little bit about the explanation that he gives, but I'm not going to be sharing any pictures because like I said, I don't want my videos to promote ableism, but to be informative as to understanding early modern science and medicine. So like I said, Ambroise Paré was a barber surgeon at this time. Uh, surgeons were kind of started out as barbers and they would also uh, extract teeth and then they would basically climb up the ladder until they became surgeons. Ambroise Paré was a very famed surgeon and he was actually the one who attempted to save Henry II's life. So Henry II was a French king in the 16th century who died as a result of a lance that ended up in his eye. He was jousting at, in a tournament and he got injured by a piece of a lance. It, it was infected and he died from the infection. Ambroise Paré operated on him and unfortunately was unable to save his life. But most of Paré's work was on the battlefield where he performed amputations. In the 16th century is where we, you know, start to see uh, firearms being used in war. Um, and the weapon was called an arquebus. Basically, it was a, it was a gun that would essentially explode whatever it hit. So, you know, people who were hit in the arm, it would dissolve flesh bone. It would require amputation. And what Ambroise Paré revived was something that was actually found in Galen but hadn't really persisted in medicine, which was the ligature of arteries rather than cauterizing the wound. So he would cut off circulation before amputating. And that is his greatest contribution to modern medicine. Uh, he also developed prosthetics made out of porcelain and glass. So while what I will be talking about today might at times seem outlandish, although I'm not going to tell you that it's, you know, you, you can believe whatever you want, do know that Ambroise Paré was a very serious surgeon and that he is important for really embracing uh, developments in, in medicine in the 16th century. And even while in this book he will talk about things as omens, um, either as representing evil or as being, you know, miracles of God. He doesn't deny for a minute the necessity of embracing medicine. Um, he's actually very critical of superstitious um, medicine. Basically, people would have these incantations that they would use to try to heal people of illnesses for which there were cures. Um, and Paré will say that that is inappropriate, that medicine exists to improve upon nature, um, and that it is a gift from God. Ambroise Paré also wrote an autobiography, which now I want to read, which is translated as Journeys to Diverse Places. The edition of the book that I read, if you can read French, is translated um, by Michel Généré. Unfortunately, this is a white cover, um, so I'll just hold it like that. That's the cover. Michel Généré did this translation and this edition. His preface is fantastic. Um, I would highly recommend it. It has definitely informed my video. Um, what I also like is that if you see the text here, he has, oh, I don't know if I can show you, he has included the glossary in the footnotes as opposed to the end notes where they often are hidden. So I just wish there were more, there were more editions of pre and early modern books with 
the glossary in the footnotes. It was so helpful and there's certain words that I see all the time in 16th century writing. I have not always looked up what the words mean today, like what the modern French is, so it was really nice to have that clarified in the footnotes. Another thing about Ambroise Paré that Généré mentions is that while he was Catholic his entire life, he was very sympathetic to Protestants and indeed he cites Clément Marot several times in this book. Uh, Marot translated the Psalms in verse in French and his translation of the Psalms became the Psalter for the Huguenot, the French Calvinist. You can see that he's a quite an open-minded person um, and you know definitely a very interesting figure. This book um, which is translated as On Monsters and Marvels is clearly intended to be entertaining and you know to really inspire marvel and amazement towards God's creation. It is really ultimately a book that glorifies the divine and also has a cautious tale here about you know activities to avoid so as not to create certain creatures. There is medicine in it but it is definitely intended for a wider audience and there were many books like this. Um, he has other books that are much more technical and much less sensational. So this book is divided into 13 essentially sections where he gives 13 causes for monsters and marvels. So monsters are natural. Uh, they are anomalies, but they are still natural in that they are willed by God. Whereas the marvels, what are in French is prodige, are actually demonic. They are omens that represent demonic activity and they are not natural. However, you know, what is a monster? I say that monsters aren't very common, but then later he will start talking about whales and other animals that are common, not to Europeans, but do exist, um, and that contemporary explorers had discovered. Ostriches, toucans, chameleons, flying fish, sharks, uh, giant snails. So there are animals in here that were really discovered in the 16th century. And so what would happen is, you know, if they were discovered and the explorer could capture the animal, they would then bring it to France. The king at the time, Charles IX, um, had his own cabinet of curiosities where he would keep specimens. Sometimes he would give the specimens to Ambroise Paré, who would keep it in his own cabinet of curiosities. And in this work, on Monsters and Marvels, Ambroise Paré will mention whenever he has a particular specimen in his cabinet of curiosities. He has, for example, the skeleton of an ostrich uh, because Charles IX had three ostriches. People were really, really interested in all of these new animals that were discovered, um, animals that for some of us are quite familiar. So Ambroise Paré, um, while he wasn't trained as the humanists were, he still values having an encyclopedic knowledge and he definitely shows that in this work. He will cite Pliny, he will cite Aristotle, he cites other contemporaries who were explorers. Um, and so he really tries to show that he has knowledge of different authors. And the most important thing for the humanists was knowledge of the ancients. And so that means that he will borrow stories from sources that today we might consider less authoritative. For example, Pliny, who only became more popular in the 16th century. And some of the stories that, at least for some of us, seem to be a bit outrageous um, come from Pliny. Um, he does generally tell you where he gets these stories. Some of these cases he has seen with his own eyes, some of these cases he hasn't. So respect for the ancients is one of the big reasons why there is a mix of modern and ancient in this work and it's also the reason why pillaging is so common. Um, what we call plagiarism today wasn't as much of a big deal especially because there was no right of the author. And finally early modern authors tend to give all sources equal weight so whether something is known by hearsay or whether something is known in, because of it was written or whether it's known, you know, they're, they're not necessarily evaluating sources in the same way that we are evaluating sources today. Okay, so having established all of that about who Ambroise Paré was and 
work, what he's trying to do in this book, I do want to start with cases that we are all familiar with, conjoined twins, intersex individuals. Um, and what he essentially argues is that these kind of cases occur because there is an excess of generative material. So at this time, um, the view of reproduction essentially was that humans, uh, so sperm was like tiny, tiny human that was then transmitted from the man to the woman. As Ambroise Paré actually mentions quite a bit in this book, the woman's imagination and the environment of her uterus would influence the physicality of the child. So if there was an excess of material, then you might get twins, triplets, conjoined twins, intersex individuals. There's also uh, the issue of women who might stare intently at the picture of something while they are delivering their child and then their child comes to resemble that image. So it appears to me that this explanation is inspired by the Bible where Jacob is breeding sheep. I mean, but he's not breeding sheep. Basically the sheep look at a certain pattern and then their offspring come to, resemble, come to have that pattern. So this was translated to humans um, and so women who might look at a picture of a certain child could have their child, their own child, resembling that picture even if the two children are unrelated. This is the explanation that is given for a woman who never committed adultery, was married to a white man but had a black child and they evidently she was going to be arrested and then they discovered that no she was in staring intently at a picture of a black child and that's why her child was black. Um, there is an example, and I'm going to show you this picture because I think it's quite interesting, of um, a woman who was in labor while staring at a leg of beef hanging from somewhere and she was staring at it, maybe it was hanging to dry, and she was staring at it while in labor and her child ended up looking like this. So there is our calf child. So the head and then, you know, you see the hooves are of a cow and then, but it's a, it's a child because it's bipedal and you can kind of tell it's supposed to be a human. So it's part human, part calf. Um, so that's an example of what might happen if a woman stares too intently at something. There are other explanations at this time. So during um, sex, if the man is not fully involved, you know, like he's not fully intellectually engaged in the sexual act, his child could be stupid and vice versa. If he's fully present, his child could be brilliant. Um, there's also uh, stories in here about women who suddenly just tra get transformed into men. And the explanation that's given is that there was an increase in heat in that region and a woman can transform into a man. However, Ambroise Paré says, men cannot change into women naturally because nature always moves towards perfection and a man becoming a woman would be the opposite of that, unfortunately. <laughs> so uh, yeah, women um, are not the ideal human. My favorite explanation is of what at this time I refer to as sodomites and atheists. And according to Ambroise Paré, sodomites and atheists tend to have sex with animals and therefore have offspring that are half human and half whatever animal they had sex with. Okay, note about the word sodomite. Sodomite is anyone who performs sexual activity that is considered unnatural. So while that does include homosexuality, it includes a whole wide range of sexual activity. But uh, I thought I would share with you some of the pictures uh, because you might find them interesting. Um, you have this creature. So this is a, a man who is mostly pig, but he has a head of a man. Uh, this woman is same. So this is a female version. This is like pig, woman. Uh, so this is a warning for people uh, to not have sex with animals. Witchcraft. So witchcraft is mentioned here. There is this great myth that thankfully more and more people are 
busting, that people in the Middle Ages were obsessed with witchcraft and with punishing witches. That is actually an early modern concern. It begins in the 16th century. Um, it's particularly something the Protestants were concerned about. Um, so you, you, you start to see more and more witch burnings in the 16th and 17th centuries than ever before in history. Um, so yes, there's this huge myth in the Middle Ages. It's all about witch burnings when in fact, it's the early modern period where the witch burnings occurred, what we like to call the Renaissance. Um, the Renaissance was a very violent period. Um, I think there's this romanticization of the Renaissance as opposed to the quote-unquote Middle Ages, which is an invention of the humanists in the 16th century. They are the ones who created this idea of the Middle Ages so that they can understand themselves as set apart. You can see here, however, how mixed all of these elements are. There isn't this clear break suddenly in 1500, like, oh, we're no longer in the past, we're now in this new modern age. But ultimately, like I said, Ambroise Paré is not about trying to scare people or to demonize humans or to suggest that, you know, all of these marvels come from demons. In fact, he actually challenges the idea that demons can father children because he say, well, children are humans and, and humans cannot be fathered by demons. So instead, he says that, you know, we should do what we can with medicine, but also accept that there will always be things that humans do not understand. And, you know, even today, as we constantly are discovering new creatures in the oceans, um, I, I think that there's just a great way of thinking about the world. I love biology. I did my undergraduate in biology as well as in French. And what I loved about biology was discovering how the world works, but also this appreciation of how much we still don't know and how just in 10 years there have been so many scientific discoveries, uh, both of the natural world, but also in medicine. It's just, it's incredible. Um, and hopefully that is something optimistic that we can carry with us. Uh, at this time where we are dealing with a pandemic. The book ends with a discussion of the Ptolemaic universe. The sun is described as moving um, and, you know, he's amazed. He's amazed by how the sun moves even while we don't notice it moving. Of course, it's geocentrism. He thinks it's amazing that you, a meteor that is huge can somehow fly in the sky. Uh, he doesn't really understand where that comes from. The cover of this book you see this? So you're probably wondering what this is. This is evidently a creature that appeared in 1513 when Pope Julius II, who was the warrior pope, was at war with Louis the Twelfth, And it appeared to people in Ravenna, so in Italy. And it was, I guess, to be a sign that this pope was not holy. A lot of the omens that are mentioned here occurred in the 16th century around a time that really huge changes occurred in Europe. So that is my spotlight video today about Ambroise Paré. Let me know if you have ever come across anything like this in other works. I hope to make more spotlight videos in the next few weeks. I know many of you are at home and are probably just hoping for people to make more YouTube content. So I will try to do that. Thank you everybody for watching and I will talk to you later. Bye now.